it's not a coincidence that West Texas is is simultaneously one of the nationwide leaders in curtailed renewable energy and the fastest growing Bitcoin mining and and battery jurisdiction altogether. You know, the, over the last five years, there's been almost no base generation, base reliable, always online generation added to ERCOT. There's been tremendous load growth. Almost all of that load growth has been met by intermittent generation installation. So solar and wow. wind. Hello and welcome back to Transmission. Today's episode is with Jamie McAvitie, CEO at Cormint. The conversation covers how Bitcoin mining can be used to support the grid and why West Texas, the curtailment capital of the US, is perfect for both Bitcoin and batteries. Hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if there's a topic you'd like to hear discussed, please get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. With that, let's jump in. Good morning, Jamie. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Good morning to you. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. It feels now like battery energy storage and grid scale Bitcoin mining. Uh, those two asset classes are inextricably linked in ERCOT. You can't understand one without really a knowledge and understanding of the other. And to have you on and tell us everything that's happening in, in, in that world is going to be fascinating today. So thank you. Before we get started, can you just explain who you are and who's Cormint or what, what's Cormint? Yeah, sure. So my name is Jamie McAvity. Uh Most people butcher the pronunciation of my last name, uh, but uh, that's the correct pronunciation. Uh, it, the incorrect pronunciation is uh, McCavity, like the mystery cat from the musical Cats, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with being from the UK. So I, I started my career in uh, energy futures, energy derivatives. I was a floor trader on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange, which was bought by the CME. Uh, after about eight years commodity day trading and market making, I yearned for a more peaceful life with not 16 hours of market activity Sunday through Friday. So uh, I retired from the energy industry and I moved into technology for five or six years. I, I built a startup company that was focused on the apartment industry, which was uh, much less fast paced and had very little to do with markets. It was, it was a great experience and I learned a lot about company building and startup building during that time. But I realized that the markets and, and the energy markets were the place where I wanted to spend my career. During that, that startup period, in around 2013, I discovered Bitcoin and started investing in it and learning in it. And then in 2018, my three co-founders and I started uh, Cormant, which is a Bitcoin mining company, uh, but we have a history of mining just about any different type of, of cryptocurrency that you can imagine. And we are currently headquartered in West Texas. We only do business in West Texas. And most people don't realize this, but West Texas is the fastest growing renewable energy jurisdiction in the entire world. So it's a great place to access cheap power. And it's a, it's a great place to be a Bitcoin miner. And um, to, to frame this conversation, we're going to talk a lot about Fort, Fort Stockton. So, so what's Fort Stockton apart from a place? And why is it so special to you? Uh, yeah, well, Fort Stockton is a city within a county that's called Pecos County. And Fort Stockton is the nationwide capital in curtailment of renewable energy. Uh, this is a 2022 number. I don't have 2023 yet. But in 2022, there were over a million megawatt hours of renewable energy that were curtailed wow. in Pecos County. Uh, so it is it is the capital of stranded renewable power. You could think of it like that. And the reason why it's like that is there. So Fort Pecos County is very close to the Midland Odessa area of Texas, which is the, the kind of center of the Permian Basin oil industry. So there's a ton of oil, there's a ton of natural gas, there's a lot of industry that is working on extracting those commodities in that region. Pecos County is just south of that. And it's kind of like the, the ugly stepchild of the family, uh, unfortunately, in terms of minerals, it's a very beautiful place. Uh, and obviously has redeeming qualities for other industries, but it doesn't have any minerals. So, or it has very, very little minerals compared to those other counties. So the land there is very cheap. It is a desert like region. So it's, it's got extremely robust solar generating capabilities. And it's also very, very windy because it's a, it's a long flat plain area. 
And then there are the, the topographical features are that they're these high mesas that rise up out of these long flat plains acting as an accelerant for wind power. And so within Pecos County, there is a tremendous amount of solar and, uh, and wind that is installed. And that, that has been chasing federal production tax credits for about the last 15 years. So it's, it's really exploded in growth. And yeah, now it, you could say the industry is slightly overbuilt. And so as is kind of a law of economics, cheap energy attracts businesses that thrive on cheap energy. So now there's a number of other industries popping up there like Bitcoin mine and uh, and data centers. And l- I want to talk about negative pricing for a second. So there's a lot of negative pricing there. There are two factors to this question. So firstly, why is Texas such a good place for Bitcoin mining? And then on negative pricing, could you just um, explain that? Because it might sound a bit crazy to, to some folks. Why would prices go negative? Yeah, sure. Well, Texas is a great place to do business in general. Probably one of the best places to do business in the world because it has a very strong historical commitment to free markets and favorable regulation. The regulatory environment there is incredible. The regulators are there to help businesses grow. Not They're not there to enact a particular agenda. And, and if they are there to enact an agenda, it's to support a free market. So excellent regulatory climate, uh, no state income tax, very favorable development conditions. The labor market is really strong. It's It just couldn't be a better place. We're coming from operating in upstate New York, and New York State is not a great place to build a business, especially a Bitcoin business. Uh, so Texas is great. West Texas has a lot of, uh, of renewable energy. 92% of the renewable or the generation capacity installed in West Texas is renewable. So it, it is one of the most renewable grids in the entire world by region, if not the most. And the reason why we have negative pricing there is because mainly wind power, but now also solar is is capable of receiving production tax credits, federal production tax credits for renewable energy, which is a $27 a megawatt hour credit that you receive from the government if you generate a megawatt hour of renewable energy. And if, let's just look at the case of wind, for example. Wind's capacity factor in this part of the United States is about 30 to 35%. So one megawatt of installed wind turbines generates a roughly 2,900 megawatt hours per year. If you get a $30 production tax credit, just below $30 production tax credit on that, that's 100 grand a year in tax credits. And the tax credits last 10 years. So you're earning a million dollars in tax credits over a 10-year period for generating wind energy. And the cost to build one megawatt of wind power is about a million dollars. So effectively, the entirety of wind projects in this part of West Texas, similar conditions like this are in Oklahoma, Western Oklahoma, the entirety of the project is paid for by tax credits. So the what's called the tax equity investor is the investor who puts in capital to the project up front, and then they receive the tax credits, they receive the depreciation. They're basically an investor in the project, mainly for its positive tax benefits, which is an income tax credit or, or production tax credit. And then they get a bunch of depreciation as well. So it just goes to offset other income other where, other in other places in their investment portfolio. Um, that investor really drives the operating agreement of the project. So that investor says, I don't care if the price of energy is negative $5 a megawatt hour. I don't care if it's negative $10 a megawatt hour. I care that my production tax credits get generated. And so the operating agreements for a lot of these wind farms explicitly state that the wind farm must generate down to negative pricing, you know, as far as negative $26 a megawatt hour, because the tax credit is negative $27 a megawatt hour. So they are the the dominant party and investor in these deals. And effectively, you have all of this wind power out there that has an incentive to not shut off their generation, to not curtail generation down to negative $26. And the market will continue to pay people to take power or drive drive the the LMPs and settlement prices to go further and further negative so that some generator does shut off. So it's kind of like this, there's no incentive for anybody to shut off or they legally can't based on their operating agreement. And there's, there's something sim- similar in uh, Great Britain with um, subsidies for wind farms, especially in Scotland, when on a particularly windy day, 
you can't get all the power from Scotland down to south where the load is. And so because of the subsidies, you have negative pricing and it really skews the market. But for folks like you who are major loads on the network, this is fantastic, right? Because you get paid to take power. Let's just talk about that for a second. The, the project that you've got over there, can you put some numbers around it? Do you want to give us the overview of that project? What's the story there? Sure, yeah. It's actually a really interesting story. So we met a wind farm owner in late 2020, and th their wind farm was built in 2008. So the, the 10 years of tax credits had expired, and they were effectively losing money because they were competing against all these other wind farms who did still have their tax credits. Uh, and they were looking for a creative solution to revitalize the asset or if they couldn't successfully do that, they were going to just decommission it. And so they eventually made the decision to decommission it. We bought the decommissioned wind farm from them, uh, which meant all of the turbines were taken down. It was it spanned over 10,000 acres. All the turbines were taken down. And what remained was the substation and a private transmission line. So 138 kV transmission line and 175 megawatt substation remained in place. We effectively bought those assets and then we converted it uh, into a data center. So right now uh, we're energizing load that will bring us up to 60 megawatts of around the clock load. Wow. And we're by the end of this year, we'll be at 120 megawatts. Uh, our business model is, is I mean, it's, it's relatively simple, but there's complexity in operating it, which is simply that we're just a real-time market price taker. And when there are periods of excess solar or excess wind, usually our Bitcoin mine is humming away. Uh, about 10% of the time, we're being paid to take power. About 65% of the time, the cost that we pay for power is below two cents a kilowatt hour. Um, but 10% of the year, we're offline completely. So our capacity factor is 90%. Uh, it is variable. It's not based on wind speeds or photovoltaic output or anything like that. It's just based on the load zone price of electricity. So our Bitcoin mining equipment can power down in seconds in response to changes in the load zone price of electricity. And that's basically what our model is. We consume so long as prices are cheap. And when prices are expensive, we power down the entire mine. So let's just talk about shape of that for a second. So for generators or, you know, a, a lot of assets on the grid think about ramp rates. And you mentioned seconds there. So a Bitcoin mine, does it look like a big square wave? Are you basically on or off? You're at full power or zero? Is that how the maths works out in that? If, if it's worth you running, you might as well run at full base load, if you like. And um, how long does it take to switch on and off? And um, what are the other considerations? Because I know you've got, perhaps we should talk about this in a second, but you have Bitcoin mining, but you also have cooling systems, you have ancillary systems. There's a lot going on there engineering wise. Could you just talk to that for a second? Yeah, good question. So right now, just based on where Bitcoin mining revenues are expressed in dollars per megawatt hour, you are correct. And your intuition is correct that we are either on or off, but there is a curve. And the reason why there's a curve is because Bitcoin mining equipment it becomes more efficient the the fewer watts that you run through it. So the the standard wattage of our machines that we're running there is about thirty five hundred watts. You can run them as high as four thousand watts. They become slightly less efficient there. You can run them as low as twenty two hundred watts, and they become more efficient there. And what that actually mathematically equates to is that the high efficiency mode has a a dollars per megawatt hour break break even. That's slightly lower than the, the medium efficiency and the medium efficiency is slightly lower than the low efficiency. So there is a curve, but it's not really in play now because the curve is between $70 a megawatt hour and $100 a megawatt hour. And you just don't see a lot of electricity pricing land in that area. If it were down closer to where the most commonly occurring intervals were, which I would say would be between 15 and, and $40 a megawatt hour, it would make sense to to be more operating on that curve. And, and that's probably what the business will look like, at least for some period of time in the future. So is what you're saying, because power is so cheap in that region, most of the time, you you don't have to do much optimization around it. You just, you just run full pelt. And then as over time, 
power prices will change. There is there is room for optimization around power prices, but at the moment, mm -hmm. there's such a difference between your operating costs and the power price, or your your short run marginal cost of a Bitcoin miner is so far in the merit order that you just run. Yes, in this in this specific market environment, that is the case. There's not much efficiency tuning or, or wattage tuning to target specific efficiencies and break evens uh, that we do right now. But in the future, I, I predict that that will happen. Most of the optimization that is done would be optimizing in the ancillary service market, doing day ahead versus real time optimization, optimizing a hedge uh, against the you know the the realized uh, day ahead prices or real time prices, and lastly congestion and transmission optimization. So the as far as the intraday, it's 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 relatively simple on or off. Uh, but then in the surrounding markets, there's a, a lot of opportunities to monetize the curtailability of the load. I mean, the load is it, there's it's unlike any other load that exists in a in a grid because you can power down 95% of the load in seconds. You can power it back up in seconds. Uh, and so in some cases, it's actually a bit too fast because if you're a grid operator you'd prefer to have loads and generation matching each other within the the dispatch software in Arcot, it's called SCED. Uh, and the Bitcoin mining load is a bit too quick for that. But we work pretty closely with the regulators and we're actively working on optimizing the, the system so that the Bitcoin miners work really, really well with the system operations team and actually you know in, improve reliability over the long run. Before we go down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin mining and its contribution to the grid, just like, we should probably set some ground rules, which is that we're not going to go down. Uh, we're not. We're not going to talk much about you know Bitcoin versus other currencies or any of that stuff. I think we, by having this conversation, we have to assume that we're interested in that, and we're going to leave that alone. We're more interested in the grid and the contribution that Bitcoin miners make to the grid. Before we get there, though, can you just talk about what? a Bitcoin miner looks like for folks who haven't seen these things? What 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 equipment is there on site? Is it in a big building? Is it tall? Is it short? Is it underground? You know, what, what other systems are there? What How long do they take to build? Can you give us a quick overview of that? Yeah, absolutely. So a, a Bitcoin mining computer looks like a shoebox. Uh, it does not look like a desktop uh, tower or a, a laptop. It's the right way to think of a Bitcoin mining computer is effectively like a, you know, the engine of, of a muscle car where it is designed to do one computation. So a Bitcoin mining chip is called an ASIC, which stands for application specific integrated circuit. It literally means it's a very dumb chip. It can't do uh, thousands of applications like your regular CPU and GPU combinations in your in your computer can do. It can only do this one algorithm over and over again, which is called the SHA-256 algorithm. Algorithm That's the algorithm that it, Bitcoin is organized around for its mining process. And the way it's optimized is actually the, the gates, the physical gates on the board, on the circuit board, are organized in such a way that it can perform this computation as efficiently as possible. So it's orders of magnitude more efficient than a, a CPU or a GPU at performing the specific computation. The rest of the unit, you know, in addition to this very dumb specific use chip, is designed to move as much airflow through the machine as possible because the muscle car analogy that I made, I use that because in a muscle car, you're trying to dump all this fuel into the engine and, and produce as much combustion as possible. In Bitcoin mining, you're trying to jam as many watts through this circuit board as possible because each watt that you push through produces a corresponding amount of Bitcoin, a fraction of a Bitcoin. Uh, and so the name of the game for being very, very good at Bitcoin mining means having excellent cooling. So most Bitcoin miners, their facilities have massive auxiliary fans that support the, the machine specific fans. Uh, a lot of Bitcoin miners remove the fans in their entirety and actually submerge the miners into a non-conductive hydrocarbon-based fluid, which is pumped through the machine rather than using air to cool the chips. And the reason why they do that is because a fluid coats 100% of the surface area of a chip. And so its, it's capabilities in dissipating heat are much more effective than air. The 
final frontier for our industry is water cooling. Uh, water cooling, water is, is five times more effective as a thermal conductor than oil, meaning it can absorb heat five times better. And if you can incorporate water cooling into computer operations, your ability to remove heat from a chip becomes greatly improved. Uh, but with water, then you're entering into condensation issues, freezing issues, you know, you're using a much more delicate form of coolant. And so it introduces all these catastrophic risks into the business if you use water. And the reason why it's moving in that direction is because as long as your computer chips are operating at 60 degrees Celsius, you can push as many watts through them as possible. So this, this muscle car-esque feature of the Bitcoin mining industry where there's a zero, zeroed in focus on cooling uh, is really you know, about optimizing economic outcomes. So I imagine it's like if you're a gas generator, more efficient gas generators get more run hours or more margin um, than less efficient gas generators. And um, I expect it's the same for Bitcoin miners. There is an incentive to become as, as efficient as possible because, as you say, getting more watts through that system creates more economic outcome for you. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the name of the game. The name of the game is like, like other commodity production how how cheaply can you build the means of extracting the commodity which would be how cheaply can you build data center infrastructure you know electricity transformation infrastructure and cooling infrastructure and network infrastructure those would be the three main pillars of data center infrastructure then the servers themselves you have to pay a, a cost effective price for those uh and then the actual performance of the machines and the maintenance of the machines so, so all of those disciplines they come together to make you know a bitcoin mining firm good or bad and the bitcoin mining community in texas or the folks who are connected to ERCOT, you, you said the fort stockton project is about 60 megawatts at the moment going to be 120 soon this is a serious kit that's like a, kind of an open cycle gas turbine sort of size how big is the bitcoin mining community in in, in ERCOT, and what what's next yeah, so in ERCOT, we have about uh, 2.5 gigawatts of Bitcoin mining load in total relative to system-wide peak load last summer, uh, which was 84 gigawatts. So that's roughly 3% of the peak load is Bitcoin mining. What's interesting is that Bitcoin mining really most likely does not contribute to peak load. So uh, it's more, the probably the better measurement for it is against the the min load uh, at any time and um yeah i think we've reached the point for the grid where this the grid operator is beginning to become a little bit more cautious about the the quantum of bitcoin mining load that is on the system and they understand it very well now there's a regulatory framework in place to harness the benefits of bitcoin mining which would be its predictability, its controllability, and obviously the price signal that it sends in the market, as you know, we'll probably talk about later, it's the same as batteries. It buys cheap power, and then it, it adds to reliability by either uh, discharging the battery in the case of battery or curtailing the mine lo mining load in the case of the mining load. But 2.5 gigawatts, that's a lot. Uh, there's, there's potentially more coming. I think there's something like 25 gigawatts in the interconnection queue. This question gets asked a lot. Is that all going to come online? 25 gigawatts and of miners. It's not clear if it's all miners. They don't, they don't delineate between which users. But there was definitely a mad rush to uh, request capacity in ERCOT over the last three or four years. And total global Bitcoin mining capacity is about 14 or 15 gigawatts. So if ERCOT alone were to add 25 gigawatts of mining, that would increase the, the footprint of the entire network by... Uh, 160% plus or minus. And if that were to happen, almost every Bitcoin miner on earth would become unprofitable because it's a it's a game of relativity. So it's not going to happen. And uh, ERCOT's doing a good job of, of slowing it down a little bit, but still being very constructive on the regulatory front. Two and a half gigawatts of Bitcoin miners. So two and a half out of the 14 total. It's a, it's a, I'm surprised. Well, I mean, I must say here, my bias is I'm uh, a big fan of Bitcoin and the, the whole concept. And you'd think that we're at the point where nation states see it as a, 
a point of national importance to have Bitcoin mining on their home turf. I mean, it's, it's almost like a security issue. This thing is not going away and actually can, in my opinion, and um, I'm sure many of our listeners can, can reap many, many benefits for society. The last thing you want is all of that being uh, mined on another nation's turf. So terrific, really, for the US. They have this massive, massive Bitcoin community in Texas and it's growing so quickly. Um, a lot of people... We're going to talk about batteries and Bitcoin now because they're often in the same bucket. There's a Venn diagram where people often put a lot, a lot of overlap between batteries and Bitcoin. And parts of this are actually quite contentious. So could you just talk for a second about how you think about batteries, batteries and Bitcoin being in the same universe um, and then some strengths and differences of each? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's not a coincidence that West Texas is is simultaneously one of the nationwide leaders in curtailed renewable energy and the fastest growing Bitcoin mining and, and battery jurisdiction altogether. You know, that what you are seeing with increasingly intermittent renewable dominated grids, you know, just as a, as a data point here, over the last five years, there's been almost no base generation base, reliable, always online generation added to ERCOT. There's been tremendous load growth. Almost all of that load growth has been met by intermittent generation installations, so solar and wow. wind. And what you're seeing is that pretty much the our exact consumption shape, 90% of the time, power is very, very cheap and, and abundant. 90% of the time, power is below 3 cents a kilowatt hour. Our numbers were 2.7 cents a kilowatt hour at a 90% capacity factor in 2023, just as, as kind of a data point. Is so just to put exploding. that in context for our European listeners, that's probably about half or less than half the wholesale cost of power in Europe. Right. And it, it, that's, we're about half of the around the clock uh, wholesale power cost in ERCOT. So the around the clock for one full year wholesale power cost in ERCOT is five and a half cents. So we're about exactly half of that. And so Think about it like this, 90% of the time contributes to half of the cost of, uh, of one year, and then the remaining 10% of the time makes up the other half. So, so that remaining 10% of the time is exploding in price because there has not been responsive generation built that can ramp up to respond to high prices. This whole... Uh, Everything about ERCOT feels like it's about long tail distributions. It just feels that like this whole system is is like that. A few days you get all the action, or um, a few regions get um, huge spreads, or you know, it's it just feels that way. It it is that way. You're you're absolutely correct. The if you look at summer of 2023, for example, uh, natural gas prices were relatively low natural gas prices are now on their multi-decade lows so primarily in over the last few decades the price of natural gas was the the primary input in determining where the cost of power was going to be when most of these grids were were powered by natural gas plants in the summer of 2023 in a relatively low gas environment we had of the top 11 months and i say a, a top 11 because one of them was number 11 Three months from 2023 contributed to the top 11 around the clock monthly prices in ERCOT history. So 2023 contributed three of the top 11 going back, um, you know, to the record books from all time. So you're seeing that power prices, and it was a record hot summer, so we take it with a grain of salt, but power prices are going up and they're being driven by this 10% of time window which is usually during the summer. Occasionally, it could be during the winter. You know, summer peaks would be the afternoon. Winter peaks would be the mornings. And it's all hours ending 18, 19, 20, and 21. So it is when the sun goes down <laughs> that you see this record pricing. And the prices were astronomical. I mean, that, those hours were averaging in the 20 to, to 70 cents per kilowatt hour range, 20, 200 to $700 per megawatt hour range for the entirety of the month of August uh, and good chunks of June, July, and September. And our battery revenue index, so we, we, we run indices on the performance of batteries in a number of places, but the, our, all of our indices for ERCOT basically broke our graphs in summer. <laughs> it was just, it was in, incredible. 
is just out of this world. Yeah, I mean, they did great. That was Bitcoin miners and batteries are both uniquely capable of responding to volatility in different ways. You know, Bitcoin miners can buy a power hedge and then curtail their load in response to high prices and they can collect the difference. Batteries can charge during cheap hours and discharge during expensive hours. And so the the rapid decline of solar output starting around 4 or 5 p.m., it creates this, this very time-specific volatility window where you're losing 15,000 megawatts of generation very suddenly. It's extremely hot. Everyone's cranking their air conditioning and somebody's got to make up the difference. So you have all these loads coming offline and you have all these batteries discharging. You have peaker plants spinning up and it just happens so quickly that the price volatility is usually enormous. You just have this almost vertical net load ramp, which, I mean, the control room engineers must, must just must dread it. When it comes around, you know, uh, it's almost dinner time and it's know, the things yeah. get a bit crazy. So, so let's talk about the, the Bitcoin camp and the battery camp, because there's been, to me, it seems pretty straightforward that all these folks are operating in the same pool. Some Bitcoin mines can provide some ancillary service. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. But a lot of a lot of the characteristics of a Bitcoin mine are very similar to a battery. Yet there seems to be this that the, it hasn't all been that smooth running between the two camps. So what's going on there? Well, I mean, both both of these market participant types have the ability to be long volatility in either direction. You know, a Bitcoin miner that's unhedged benefits from persistent periods of, of zero dollar or negatively priced electricity, that's when a battery is is most likely trying to charge, is to have no input costs on their power. The same token, Bitcoin mining loads are coming offline when batteries would be most likely to discharge. So they're, you know, it's it's effectively like we're on the same side of the market, but providing a very not a very different, but a somewhat different market behavior type where batteries are consuming load bitcoin mines are consuming load when prices are cheap and batteries are actually putting more generation onto the system when prices are high whereas bitcoin mines are reducing load and so they are competitive there's there's plenty of uh, of chicken to go around the dinner table so Just to, to speak in terms of to break that down for a second so if, if bitcoin mines are taking cheap power but then they're sort of nibbling away as load against um, negative pricing or very low pricing. What that does, the more Bitcoin miners there are, technically actually reduces spreads on the bottom exactly. side of the spread, right? On the on the low side, which I guess, I, I'm not saying that anyone in the battery community is as cynical as this, but in practical terms, what it does mean is that the more Bitcoin miners on the system, the less negative pricing or less low pricing there is for batteries to access as part of the spreads that they need for their business case. That is that is correct. And uh, by the same token, you know, the more negative pricing there is, the less of an incentive there would be for renewable generation projects to be underwritten. So if you think about the market as a big pie, then clearly we have lots of very, very cheap zero dollar and negative power that needs to be consumed. We've got federal tax incentives that are saying, build me more renewable generation, do whatever you can to build this. And then you have these incentives for different market participants who can respond to that volatility and profit from it to, to build. And I think that it's definitely true that batteries and Bitcoin compete in, in a properly, function electri properly functioning electricity market. You, there shouldn't be any discrimination between different types of market participants. Bitcoin miners and batteries are both helping the situation by contributing to the incentive for generators to build and respond to these tax credits that are have been determined by the voters to be something they want politicians to be going after. So it is, that's just the nature of it is that these volatility harnessing market participants are thriving in this now high volatility power market environment. And what, what do you see as the the nirvana, if you like, of renewables and Bitcoin mining and batteries and you know all of these future energy system technologies working together? There's a few ideas about what that might look like. What what's how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the market is is sleeping right now on the excellent overlap of Bitcoin mining loads with 
intermittent renewables. You know, you have right now, low end Bitcoin mining equipment produces about $80 a megawatt hour in equivalent revenue. High end Bitcoin mining equipment produces about $200 a megawatt hour. If, if you had a Bitcoin mining data center co-located with a renewable plant, you would have a very flexible off taker who can convert your generation into a dollars per megawatt hour equivalent that's at a premium to your nodal price. And in the event that you want to sell that power back into the grid at your nodal price, you can just curtail this Bitcoin mining load. So you have basically a put option and a call option. You're buying both sides of volatility behind the meter with your, your intermittent renewable generator. It's, it's a home run. And batteries are a similar thing. Uh, you know, it's a similar application, it, uh, even better because you get tax credits, but limited in that if you build a four megawatt hour battery, you can only consume four megawatt hours of stranded power. A oh, Bitcoin mining load can consume an endless amount of stranded power. There's a never ending bid from the Bitcoin protocol effectively to convert a watt of electricity into Bitcoins. I mean, that's the other thing that's kind of crazy. Most people don't realize the Bitcoin mining network, Bitcoin network is the single largest non-state consumer of power in the entire world. And it's growing. Now, this, this is a never ending, deep and flexible bid for power everywhere. It's it's geographically agnostic. So just thinking about how we, we're going to steel man this argument, right? Because um, whilst Bitcoin mining really supports the grid on the bid side, so on the on the lower prices side, it actually doesn't really help the grid, apart, apart from switching off and curtailing load. When 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 margins are really tight, you know, these uh, these hot summer periods, 80 gigawatts of you know net load, that those periods where prices go crazy and really we we have some big engineering problems to solve on the grid. The the problem is, I guess, if we're gonna steal man it, is that the, the Bitcoin mining solution doesn't actually help on that side of the market, whereas batteries do. So you you, you end up choosing between with this limited network infrastructure, i.e. grid connections. You've got this one asset that they look kind of similar, but one asset class at, at class Bitcoin mining, which is the ultimate, as you say, the deepest bid on the market, which serves one type of purpose, but it doesn't actually shift power to serve solve the solution on the other end of the market, which is the end that gets all the attention because that's what pushes up consumers' bills. That's what is that, you know that is technically where the highest emissions are on the network because you're running an efficient uh, or less efficient plant. And so I guess as a society, what we've got to figure out is the ratio or the, the amount of uh, each solution that we want in each area. Yeah, and no, you're, you're absolutely correct that Bitcoin mining as a demand response uh, tool is it's not putting extra megawatts on the grid. It's just not contributing to peaks. And so the right way to think about Bitcoin mining is as a, a tool to enhance the health of the marketplace. Right now, if you went to go build a combined cycle plant or a nuke plant in one of these grids that had a massive penetration of intermittent renewables, you would not make money. I mean, these, these plants are getting killed in these marketplaces because they're having to endure negative pricing and zero dollar pricing. And so rightfully, over the last five years, none of those generation types are getting built uh, and you're seeing massive amounts of renewables. So there really is a distortion in the market where a tax credit is basically saying, go build me power, and it doesn't matter if you ever make a dollar, I'll, I'll pay for your project via tax credit. Uh, and so if you have this indiscriminate generation industry that doesn't care really about making money and is chasing this distorted market signal, then the cure for that is a free market buyer of power who can absorb all that excess power, but also will not contribute to peak demand. Uh, that is what Bitcoin is. Bitcoin is not going to save you by putting an extra 2,000 megawatt hours on the grid during peak demand, but it is going to help restore the marketplace, which is reacting to these distorted incentive, these these price signal distorting market incentives. Do you think we'll ever have tax credits for Bitcoin miners? <laughs> no, <laughs> but I do agree with you that it is a national security priority, and I hope. And this is extremely controversial opinion I have, but I hope that one day my business gets nationalized by the great nation of Texas and they recognize that it's a strategic asset to develop and it should, you know, it should belong to the, the people of Texas. Uh, and 
yeah, I mean, most free market guys will never say come nationalize me. But in this case, like this is really important. You, and should, so, you should build one at Alamo. Uh, yeah, San Antonio is tough. You know, it's it's tough to get interconnections in South Texas because there's there's a bunch of transmission problems. Uh, but yeah, that would be cool. I mean, our the naming scheme of our operating subsidiaries is Fort. Our, our first operating subsidiary is called Fort Blocks, uh, which is a funny double entendre. <laughs> All right. So uh, last two questions. Firstly, anything you'd like to plug? Anything you're working on or any any big projects or announcements that you want to get out to our listeners? Yeah, I, I would love to plug something. So my company, we use Bitcoin denominated debt in our capital stack. So we, we borrow Bitcoin from Bitcoin holders. We invest that into the means of production to create more Bitcoin. Uh, it's a perfect asset and liability match. There's There's nothing quite like it in commodity production finance. We are planning to uh, build renewable generation. So we are planning to repower the renewables that exist in our Fort Stockton location. One of the biggest challenges that we run into there is bank guys, you know, finance guys who are doing renewable finance. That industry is extremely sensitive to credit risk uh, and all the like. And uh, so getting financing for a Bitcoin mining co-location with a bunch of renewables is going to be tough. If you're one of those... Uh, open-minded, creative thinker, creative thinkers who's got access to a bunch of, of USD capital and you want to be a part of an exciting Bitcoin project and maybe get a piece of a Bitcoin yield for repowering renewables in West Texas, hit me up because we are we got an exciting project. It's going to deliver better returns than other projects that just have regular grid interconnections. And uh, yeah, you told me a lot of bankers listen to the show. So I'm going to speak to those bankers. Come and find me. <laughs> All right, great. And we should probably say there's a whole lot of questions we didn't get to about some of your intellectual property, the software that you guys have built, more about the business model, some technical details about how Bitcoin operates and different, you know, how can it access ancillary services, regulation. There's a load of stuff we didn't cover here. So if you're listening and thought and thinking, oh, I wish they'd done that. We had it written down, but we, we didn't quite get there. But maybe next time. Now to the last one, everybody's favorite question. What is your contrarian view? Got it. Well, as a as a starting point, I'm pretty much all in on Bitcoin uh, and all in on, on this business in West Texas. So I know I've invested an enormous amount of my own assets, capital into this business. I've, uh, I've lent all my Bitcoin into this business in our uh, Bitcoin denominated lending product. And I'll take it a step further. Not only am I extremely convicted in Bitcoin, but I'm extremely convicted in the intersection between energy markets and Bitcoin. And one day, I believe that there will be a very healthy liquid market for Bitcoin denominated finance uh, for electricity. You will be able to pay for electricity in Bitcoin and the, the denominating unit for contracts, financing agreements, offtake agreements, and, and the like in electricity marketplaces will be Bitcoin. It will be a thriving and well-developed ecosystem. Wow. When? Well, we're trying to get there. You know, we, we are one of the firms who I would say is really pushing this forward. And the main issue here is large energy firms and electricity trading firms, they're extremely sensitive to credit cost of capital. And so if you add Bitcoin into your capital stack, I could see that harming those credit ratings and credit efficiencies. Bitcoin firms, on the other hand, we have nothing to lose. My firm is unbankable. The banking industry has been extremely discriminatory and predatory against us. Uh, and so we have nothing to lose. We're already wearing all of this Bitcoin risk as a company and as an executive team. So I think it's going to be bottom up. I think Bitcoin firms will make the transition, find open-minded financing partners who can just look at a model and say, this makes sense, rather than energy firms coming uh, top down and saying, okay, we're going to integrate Bitcoin into our capital stack. There's just too much of a penalty for them right now. That could change. If that changes, it could, it'll be open season. I guess if you start from a period of universal exclusion from the banking community, then every step is only positive from there. And on, on, and on that note, Jamie, I want to say a massive thank you for, for coming on. I'm, so, we, I'm sorry we, didn't, we only got about halfway through the questions. There's so much we didn't do. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll have you on again. What, one last thing is that some of the things that Jamie talked about there, we're going to put some links in the, in the show notes. So go on Spotify and check out the links. You can check out Jamie's company and some more details about the, this, uh, the Bitcoin mining at Fort Stockton. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to do it again. This was a great conversation. And uh, thank you for having me.